It is more than just a river. The Volga is a vital line of communication, 3,700 kilometers long. This is Europe's largest river, dividing it from Asia. They say it mirrors the soul of Russia. In the summer of 1942, the Volga becomes the target of Hitler's great offensive in the southern sector of the Eastern Front. The 6th Army advances on the Volga. On the 23rd of August, German tanks reach the riverbank and the city from which there will be no return. Stalingrad. Oh, what a huge relief. We've done it. Here's the Volga, and we'll get Stalingrad, too. But the illusion of an easy victory dies in the battle among the buildings of Stalingrad. We could possibly grit our teeth here and not imagine that we weren't going to capture the city. But we were already gripped by this feeling. What in hell is going on here? The war shows its cruelest face in this industrial city on the Volga. Death lurks behind every wall at any moment. Stalingrad is turned into a mass grave. Towards the end, a thousand German soldiers will die here every day. Many got up out of the trenches. They stood up out in the open and walked towards the Russians. Of course, they'd hardly got over the edge when they were shot. Many of them went to pieces up there. A battle of despair in which 500,000 Soviet soldiers will die. They must hold Stalingrad at all costs. The company commander warned us, not one step backwards. There's nowhere for us to go on the other side of the Volga. Hold out until death. An entire army will be destroyed in the ice of Stalingrad. 300,000 German troops will be surrounded. Two-thirds of them die. They will die in battle or freeze and starve to death. Survivors will never forget the scenes of death. Thousands of soldiers were lying unburied in the snow. Thousands upon thousands. The road ran through them. The wind blew across them. Something is shattered in you. I've said it before. Something inside is destroyed that you can never get back. The Red Army's shelling puts an end to the German armed forces' invincible reputation. They are making war in the Christmas season of 1942, between life and death. While families enjoy Christmas in Germany as a celebration of love, 3,000 kilometers away on the Volga, it's a matter of survival and of escaping the reality of this murderous war. Hearing German Christmas carols on the people's radio in this utterly hopeless situation, there was no need to hide your tears. I'm quite sure that many of the men in the Stalingrad division, who had forgotten how to pray, learned how to do it again. There is despair in this soldier's letter from Stalingrad. If only this killing would stop, people at home could never imagine how much we've had to endure. The amount of blood which has been spilt here could never be justified before God. At home, this agonizing death is stylized as death in action. And for a thousand years to come, every German will get cold shivers down the spine when they say the word Stalingrad. And recall that in a way, 
Germany brought about its own downfall. This is an obituary to the soldiers trapped in the Stalingrad pocket, otherwise known as the Kessel, the Cauldron. We thought, surely they can't let us down. They're sacrificing an entire army. Even to us young fellows, it was inconceivable that they could simply sacrifice 300,000 German soldiers. We couldn't understand it. As far as Hitler is concerned, it is not human life which is at stake in the Battle of Stalingrad, but above all, his prestige. The Sixth Army wants to surrender, but Hitler refuses. The city bearing Stalin's name must be held. This is Hitler's death sentence for his soldiers in the Kessel. Aircraft are the only way out of the inferno. Some escape death to start a new life. This hope is granted to a handful of men. One of them is Hans Rostowitz. Suddenly, an aircraft turned in and rolled towards us where I was standing. It stopped 10 meters ahead of me and stood there. They threw out a few crates and sacks, and we went straight to the plane's door. I wanted to explain to them that I had a bullet wound to the head. Get in, get in. 17 men only. Shut the door. The engines gave a roar, the plane wheeled round and was back in the takeoff position. There were a few more bumps, and then it took off. <laughs> 40,000 are flown out. The bloodiest, most decisive battle of the war will end in catastrophe and captivity for some 100,000 German soldiers. Only 6,000 will ever come home to Germany. And some will take 13 years to arrive. Their fate characterizes the senselessness of war. There are the same faces the summer before. It was the 28th of June, 1942. German units in the south launch an attack in the direction of the Caucasus. Moscow's defeat in the winter of 1941 seems long forgotten. Hitler's war of conquest in the east continues. The regime calls it a crusade against Bolshevism and Judaism. For the civilians, it's a bloody war of destruction. We are sent here we lined up, thinking that we're lining up against Soviet Russian subhuman creatures. And that's exactly what I mean. We were taught that we were better people than they were. The armed forces have been part of Hitler's Holocaust for a long time. A non-commissioned officer filmed this, fighting civilians and guerrillas. The spiral of violence widens. How much did the soldiers at the front know? Thank God we at the front didn't hear about what was happening in the hinterland. That only came during the course of the war. We knew about a year later. I'm only talking about Russia now. It was only then that we heard about the obscenities back there. But sometimes they become eyewitnesses. In August, a division of the 6th Army is resting in the Ukrainian city Balazha Zerkov. This is where the SS Special Unit 4A locked 90 Jewish children in a cellar on the outskirts without water or bread. The youngest ones are still babies. Their fate, their whimpering, shook the residents of Belazha Zerkov, including the family of Anna Protas. When my father came home, he was deathly pale. He was weeping. He said, I heard the children scream, Mama, at the top of their voice. They were shouting, Mama, Mama, it's still ringing in my ears. He broke down and cried. The SS shoot their mothers and fathers. What is to become of the children?
First, they fetched the men. They were told they're being taken to work, but they never returned. Then they fetched the women, without their children. The women didn't return either. Then the children had to watch as their mothers were shot, right before their eyes. And then it was the children's turn. They are brought to an orphanage and are shot soon after. An officer wants to stop the massacre. He approaches his superior, the commander of the 6th Army, Field Marshal von Reichenau. He is a modern general who regards child murder as expedient. Shortly afterwards, he commands his troops. In the eastern region, the soldier is not only a fighter according to the rules of the art of war, he also supports an uncompromising national idea. They call it the command of hardship. Men who do this are promoted by Hitler. The man who succeeds Reichenau as commander of the 6th Army is General Friedrich Paulus. Is he the right choice? I suppose Paulus was a good teacher at the War Academy. A great theorist. But he wasn't a proper army commander. He was a fatalist, hesitant. It was often only through his chief of general staff, General Schmidt, who pushed him, that he ever came to a decision. Paulus wants to have nothing to do with war crimes. But he is resigned to fighting Hitler's war, and he is ordered to advance on the Volga with the 6th Army. The code name is Operation Blue. The offensive makes speedy progress. The Germans advance more than a thousand kilometers in only a few weeks, but fresh supplies don't follow them, and many officers begin to have pangs of doubt. For heaven's sake, what were we doing? We were rushing the army headlong to its doom. It had to go wrong. It couldn't succeed. Because, of course, Higher up, Paulus couldn't find anyone who'd take what he said into consideration. They were thinking, if we continue being pessimistic, we'll be one of those pessimistic generals to an even greater degree. And tomorrow we'll be replaced, and so on. In hindsight, it's easy to sit here in an armchair and say, well, then I'd have let myself be replaced. But the kind of man to say that is, I suppose, someone other than Paulus. Hitler doesn't want to hear about the uncertainty among his generals. The Fuhrer doesn't accept that there are problems with fresh supplies. He feels that the military campaign isn't progressing quickly enough. Ever since the beginning of the war in the East, he wants to conquer everything simultaneously, the oil wells in the Caucasus and Stalin city on the Volga. So Hitler divides his forces. The main body of the troops, military unit A, tries to seize the oil fields at Baku. Military unit B marches towards Stalingrad. The generals are skeptical. The front is too long and their strength is waning. Hitler considers himself an infallible commander. Chief of General Staff Franz Halder is having second thoughts, but to no effect. He had a fit of rage. Despite everyone advising against it, he tore the operation apart and aimed one fist at Stalingrad and the other at the Caucasus. Ask any army man if he thinks that's right, and he'll tell you, no. No one drew any conclusions, not even Halder. Most of the generals went there, allowed themselves to be humiliated, went back home, and then to the front again. They were pleased. Hitler told them, take four weeks leave, and when you get back, I'll call you. So, they were more or less like football trainers. They were brought back every six months, even after they'd been sacked. 
Hitler's plan seems to be working out. The advance on the Caucasus is progressing well. The oil fields are within grasp and there is already talk of a new blitzkrieg. The armed forces reach Maikop on the 9th of August 1942, but the conquerors arrive too late. The oil fields are already burning. Hitler's advance in the south breaks down. The Russians set their own oil fields alight so that they could keep them from us. I think the Russians knew about our poor provision of supplies because we soon heard that there was no fuel. We had no fuel for our tanks. In fact, the entire division had no fuel for the vehicles. My division, for example, was only 60 kilometers away from Baku, from the oil fields, that we didn't have enough fuel to travel 60 kilometers. They never reach the oil fields of Baku. Instead, they conquer a mountain, Mount Elbrus in the Caucasus, which makes no military sense. It's just an adventure for the climbers and an annoyance for Hitler. How can you waste your time on such childishness? The soldiers should have been court-martialed and sentenced to death. But let's leave that aside. If they had let me know that the oil wells in Maikop or Grozny were working again, things would have been different. The war for oil has been lost. While the tanks are stuck in the Caucasus, the 6th Army is advancing further towards Stalingrad. The Russians can shoot as much as they like. We only shoot more. It's a joke when a few hundred Russians attack. We're looking forward to our attack, which will hopefully be soon. They'll be in for it then. There's movement on the horizon. We look again. Movement, but we can't make out what it is. Then we move a little closer, about 500 meters or a kilometer. You've got to picture this wide expanse, this incredibly fascinating plain. And we can make out that they're camels. Not only three, but about 80 or 90. They take a while to let themselves be discovered, not quite voluntarily. This is quite something for our soldiers. The captured camels are immediately employed as pack animals. Because there's no fuel, the march to Stalingrad grinds to a halt. Our tanks were parked. We still had a little fuel for us to move, of course, but we didn't have enough to launch an attack. It wasn't even enough fuel for one day. A tank regiment uses, oh, I don't have the figures handy, but it uses a lot of fuel per day. If you think that there were 200 tanks that could still advance, we had enough ammunition for at least one attack on Stalingrad. But we still had a difficult battle to face, and we didn't have enough ammunition for that. In other words, there was a real breakdown in our supply network. We could only advance on Stalingrad three weeks later than originally planned. At least our unit, our division could. Crucial days are lost. Then comes the surprise. The armed forces advance into a void. The Red Army retreats, leaving villagers and other people to an uncertain fate. Yes, we had to run from the cities and villages. Many people came with us. Those who stayed behind reproached us and said, how can you do this? 
It's a disgrace. And yes, we were ashamed. That's why we tried to avoid towns and villages and traveled along remote roads and across fields so that we didn't have to face the people who had to stay behind. We abandoned them. In Stalingrad, no one had any idea what was about to happen to the city. The metropolis on the Volga is known as a model socialist city, famous for armaments and traffic on road and river. It has 450,000 inhabitants, five high schools, and three theaters. The city stretches for 30 kilometers along the Volga. It was a beautiful city. There were multi-story buildings in the center, four, five-story buildings. And on the outskirts, there were family homes, as well as the so-called merchants' houses, double or triple-storied houses. They were very well kept. And most important was, the city was very green. The original name was Zarazin. According to legend, this is where Stalin salvaged the revolution during the Civil War. I found everything I wanted in this city. The opportunity to learn, the opportunity to recover my health, the opportunity to fish. The Volga was very rich in fish, you see. In Moscow, the commanders feared that the fall of Stalingrad could affect the outcome of the war. Stalin wants to hold the city which bears his name at all costs. On the 19th of July, he orders the Defense Committee to prepare his city for a state of war. Stalingrad, packed with refugees, is converted into a fortress. The residents must stay here, even with danger coming closer every day. In spite of neglect and a lack of supplies, the 6th Army bursts into Stalingrad. The German soldiers are confident of victory. And many are already looking forward to their holiday at home. We believe that if we could isolate Stalingrad, and with it, the Volga. The war was in effect as good as over. Perhaps one still had to advance on Moscow from the south. But as far as we were concerned, the conquest of Stalingrad and the closure of the Volga as a line of supply meant the war was practically over. The war has reached the homeland by now. Cities are bombarded more and more frequently. More and more, families must say goodbye to their fathers because they've got to go to war in the East and rarely come home. Tank driver Gerhard Kolak from Allenstein in East Prussia is on leave from the Russian front. It was the loveliest time that summer, a wonderful holiday. We had perfect weather, very good weather. We went on many outings. Gerhard Kolak rejoins the 6th Army in the summer of 1942. Then telegram came after telegram, ordering, back to the army immediately. Yeah. I didn't give him the first one. I hid it. I didn't want to let him go. The next day, there was another one. Back to the army immediately. I had to give it to him. Otherwise, they would have fetched him. And he didn't want to die like that either being fetched and shot as a coward. She will never see him again. On the 23rd of August, the leading tanks reach their target. The Volga, 
north of Stalingrad. It was an overwhelming sight. Below us was the enormously wide flood of the Volga. And on the opposite side, this low riverbank which stretched to eternity, to the furthest horizon, we were standing in Europe, looking at Asia. Our division has been refused winter clothing. Please God, dear ones, that I see you again this year. If Stalingrad falls, the Russian southern army will be destroyed. A silence, so that you don't believe you're in the midst of a war. It was the calm before the storm, we said. One of our comrades had a beautiful voice. And it's giving me goose flesh now. He sang the song of the Volga. It gave us cold shivers. How should I say? Whenever I hear the song of the Volga now, cold shivers run down my spine. The song of the Volga from the operetta The Tsarevich by Franz Lehr became the hit song of the Sixth Army. We didn't have much time to waste by standing and looking at this view towards Asia. We were being shot at by an anti-aircraft battery close by. So, we had to attack and eliminate them. We did that. We charged full speed at this anti-aircraft division. And to our horror, we discovered that it was being operated by women. Loringhoven's division is one of the first to admit that the steel ring around Stalingrad isn't so easy to penetrate, that the enemy is mobilizing all its forces, and that they even let women fight. And at the time, this appeal came, an appeal to the soldiers. There is no land for us beyond the Volga. We knew before that we will neither cross the Volga nor retreat. We didn't need convincing. We knew that's the way it has to be. We knew what we were defending, our country, and most important, our city. The German Air Force bombs the city till it's ready to be stormed. The same day that the German tanks reach the Volga, the Luftwaffe drops 41,600 bombs on Stalingrad. I remember clearly, it was a Sunday afternoon, the 23rd of August, at exactly eight minutes past four. You could hear a rumble, a terrifying rumble from the left bank of the Volga. There were air formations. At first we thought it was an exercise by our aircraft, but suddenly we heard the whistling and the explosions began. The raid is the most severe strike so far on the Eastern Front. I saw the city ahead of me, a flourishing city. We were the first to drop bombs there, because the other aircraft were deployed elsewhere. I had the impression that there was a huge industrial city below me. There were factories everywhere. Thousands of tons of bombs turned the city into an inferno. Stalingrad had to be annihilated because there were so many factories producing supplies for the Soviet army. That's why they all had to be wiped out. Every time we were given the command to target a different factory. Residential areas are destroyed too. Yeah. 
40,000 people die in Stalingrad during the first week of bombing. A huge black cloud of smoke hung over Stalingrad. And the thermal pressure weighed down on it, so that the cloud of smoke formed an enormous cross. At the time, we saw it as virtually a tombstone for Stalingrad. No one had an inkling yet that it would be the tombstone of the 6th Army. Only now are the people allowed to leave the city. Everything collapsed before our eyes. I lived on the bank of the Volga, about a kilometer from the city center. For the most part, the city was being bombed. And when the first explosion came, I realized, this is it. There is no turning back. A terrible new time awaits us. Day after day, the German bombers strike. The city soon looks like a heap of rubble. The entry in a Stalingrad girl's diary reads as follows. September the 4th. They've been bombing us for two weeks, even though there's almost nothing left to bomb. Will we survive all this? I'm scared. They're building barricades everywhere. Apparently, the real nightmare is still to come. German soldiers march into Stalingrad on the 13th of September. Many citizens are surprised by their first contact with the attackers. I saw some handsome men marching there. They looked like Olympic athletes. They carried themselves upright and had no devilish horns as the children and even we had imagined. They looked good and were quite friendly, really. The troops are there to break down the last resistance and they believe the job is done. But the real battle of Stalingrad is only beginning now. Fighting in the buildings in Stalingrad itself was new to us. That's why there were so many losses, because we lacked experience. This is warfare in a wilderness of rubble and devastation. The enemy is invisible and everywhere. It's a fight for a house, where death lurks behind every corner. You can't imagine a situation more frightening and more horrible than that. A German general writes to a friend. Attacks coming from cellars, from hidden bunkers and ruins lead to heavy losses among our troops. He runs across the battle zone with shots ringing out and with ricocheting bullets and so on. I yell out, Schapel, get down quickly! Schapel, hurry! They're firing! Suddenly, he goes down into a bomb crater. He'd been shot in the back. It had ripped open his left shoulder. And where the bullet exited on the right, everything was torn open. The air from his lungs was blowing out there. He said, well, Helmut, the war's over now. And I said, yes, Schapel, the war is over. I promise I'll fetch you tonight, I promise. Lie here quietly and I'll send the first aid people to you. You're very seriously wounded. Can you hear the air from your lungs? Yes, he said. The first aid workers arrive too late. Regiments turn into units of shock troops. They call it the War of Rats. One wrong move can be fatal. 
When fighting in the buildings, we came across all sorts of things, where Russians were sitting in the cellar, our men were on the first and the second floor, but then there were Russians on the top floor again. Oh, we often saw that in the remaining solid buildings. Every building became a fortress in the devastated city. Tanks and artillery can play no part in the battle among the rubble. Buildings are taken with machine guns and hand grenades. The stronger ones among us could throw the grenades 10 to 15 meters up into the buildings. They exploded. Then the Germans opened fire. And their aim was pretty good. Regardless of losses, Red Army soldiers were forced to attack. Our company commander, Babachkov, gave the order. Look carefully at the rooms on the first floor, right in the middle. Try driving them out with grenades first. If they jump out of the windows, we'll kill them down here. But they were stubborn. They carried on shooting. Then another grenade. And yet another. Eventually, only one German was still firing and wouldn't let us in. The daredevils turned up. They crept up close to the building and we saw them charge it from the courtyard. Then it was quiet. It was our turn. We didn't take prisoners in cases like this. There was no hands up. But the German fired and was paid back in the same way. This is the most brutal form of war. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, man against man, the battle becomes a massacre. This is how they fought in previous centuries, steel on steel. When the Russians suddenly jumped into our trenches, there was only one thing to do, grab a spade and hit in such a way that you struck right here below the head, cutting the artery and put them out of action. In this war, no weapons are barred, even the flamethrower. There was growing despair on the Russian side too. These will be the last words I write you. You'll never see me again. We're parting forever. Somehow I've become indifferent and I'm not really afraid to die. Sorry if I'm causing you pain. If only I could see you one more time. Newcomers to the front cannot cope with the hell of Stalingrad. After two or three days, I noticed that these young men were no match for what was happening. They came back and they were mentally disturbed. They laid down their arms. They had cracked up. They spoke mindlessly. Mindlessly. To put it mildly, they'd gone mad. The pictures on the weekly newsreel show a different war. Young soldiers, well cared for during a ceasefire. Reality is different. They are badly neglected and absolutely exhausted. The longer you're out there as a soldier, the more deadened you become. You switch off. What do you do if the man next to you in the trench gets a direct hit, possibly a grenade and where the man had been, not a shred is left. The grenade or the artillery missile might have exploded in his body, and then only shreds fly about. That is war. That's what war looks like, and that's the truth. Dear ones, at last I've arrived at Europe's river of fate. You'll be astonished to hear that the city which has been the object of such fierce fighting is still not in our hands. The Russians are still holding out, but not for long. The decision can come any day now. 
You can count yourself lucky every day that you don't get hurt. By the time you get this letter, the special news flash about Stalingrad's fall will have come through. How simple a piece of news like that sounds in the peace and quiet of home. But only those who have experienced something similar will ever know what goes with a report like that. How many victims were sacrificed? How many best friends were lost? The weekly newsreel is determined to report the fall of Stalingrad. The southern part of the city is firmly in German hands. Our soldiers are hoisting the swastika above an area that was fiercely fought over. On the 6th of October, 1942, Paulus calls off the attack temporarily. The troops are not prepared for the winter. They're badly neglected and cannot even hold a completely conquered Stalingrad. Hitler orders total appropriation of the city. For him, the battle has long since become a question of prestige. Because it was Stalin city, Stalingrad. That was the point, exactly, that the dictator on the other side was saying, the city bearing my name will not be taken. Then the two dictators get stuck into it and sacrificed endless numbers of people to an end, which is speaking in ideological and military terms. Absurd. There are immense losses on both sides. Time is blood. That is the motto of the defender. Hitler's chief of the general staff has warned that the front is overstretched, the losses are too high. In the coming winter, catastrophe threatens. Darauf tobte Hitler, Hitler went into a rage and bellowed at Holder. How dare you judge what one can expect from soldiers and officers? During the First World War, you sat in your swivel chair in general staff, and that's where you've been this time. I have experience at the front. I know you can expect soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and officers to be willing to die. It's a matter of honor. Hitler's helper, Halder, is dismissed. The senseless killing continues. The Red Army loses 2,500 men every day. This footage is shot in a Soviet hospital. The Germans don't let cameras into their hospitals. People suffer equally on both sides. The men lay there. Many of them couldn't move their hands. So when they were discharged, they weren't able to button up their trousers. They wet their pants. They soiled themselves without even noticing. Amazingly, I didn't smell it, even though it must have stank to high heaven. I'd gotten used to it. But when I walked into the cellar with two Red Army soldiers and told them this was a hospital, where there were many sick people. The soldiers reeled from the dreadful stench. Stalingrad has become a city of horror and terror, a city of rubble and ashes. The entire working class district and the factories have been burnt to the ground. Terror is still etched on the faces of the people. They've been made homeless. In the city, this hole in the ground is where six-year-old Lydia Araskaya and her family live. They've lost everything, but they're still alive. One day, my father opened the cover of our trench and asked the neighbor who was living in a hole in the ground next door to us, are you still alive? Are you still alive? Come out, 
The whole area was level with the ground. There were no more houses standing. When my father opened the cover, the sniper saw him. At that moment, he collapsed. He hadn't even finished his sentence. He said, are you still? The bullet hit him in the right temple. The invisible threat of the sniper lurks everywhere in the ruins of Stalingrad. A man called Zikan is said to have shot 224 Germans by the middle of November. Russians hail him as a hero. Gaja Shokolov wants to be a sniper too. It was like this. After three days, someone said to me, you're a slit-eyed, so you should be able to shoot well. Get a sniper's rifle. So I fetched one. Four of us were walking along the bank of the Volga. We had to shoot at the insulators on the telegraph poles. I hit two out of three, the others only one each. On the second day, I hit three, and the others none at all. The commander told me, you're a sharpshooter now. Sharpshooters like Garja Shokolov keep their adversaries in constant fear. Did we regard the German as a human being in those days? No. I had no problem killing them. If a vehicle was moving, I tried to hit the driver. I aimed a little further ahead. I couldn't see the driver. But the vehicle would stop. So... The Germans are living targets. Then a steel helmet came flying through the air. That was the first time I saw a human brain. The forehead had been split open right down the middle. I saw the left and the right brain and water. No blood. I saw him look at me, then fall down, face into the dirt. The Russians have remarkable sharpshooters. God help me that I may never become their target. We're freezing, but it's not even winter yet. What will happen in winter if they leave us here? Help us, Holy Mary, to get back home. The writer of that letter was fatally wounded soon after. Death comes in so many different ways. It can be as merciful as a well-directed headshot. The head falls, and one might almost think the soldier has laid down to sleep. The mighty Volga, river of fate. The soldiers of the 6th Army are now cursing this river that they couldn't reach quickly enough. We understood that was how we'd end up. We were at the places of execution. We'd spoken about it. We sang the song of the Volga once. Everyone wept. You were a young man, proud, 20 years old, and then you were executed in this manner. There were once 1,200 men in Helmut Waltz's regiment. In mid-October 1942, only 60 are still fit to fight. By the middle of October, most of Stalingrad has been taken in bloody fighting, and the armaments industry is completely destroyed. But Soviet units are still holding narrow strips along the Volga. None of the German attackers expected such dogged resistance. 
the commanded respect. Our opponents had pulled themselves together. They were in a hopeless situation because they were 150 meters from the Volga and they were defending themselves. We couldn't get any further. That was it. We couldn't get any further. But Hitler is already celebrating his conquest of the city that bears his enemy's name. The Löwenbrau Keller in Munich on the 8th of November 1942. I wanted to reach the Volga at a specific point in a specific city. It happens to bear Stalin's name. But don't think that's why I marched over there. It might have been called anything else. You know, we're modest people. We've got it, you see. There are only a few tiny places left. No ship can go up the Volga anymore. And that's the crucial thing. He couldn't care less about the dying in Stalingrad. He has committed himself. The day after, the mercury in Stalingrad drops to minus 18 degrees. Winter has come. The Volga freezes over. In the expanse of the steppes, the plains between the Don and the Volga, something even worse is lurking just over the horizon. The 6th Army's flanks are vulnerable. On the 19th of November, the Soviets attack with more than a million men and slip a noose round the city. The 6th Army is trapped. The Stalingrad victory was built on sand. Blessed are they who gain ground by retreat. As they will see their homeland again. We young ones knew where the hair runs to. Hitler hears about the noose around the 6th Army on the 22nd of November. His decision is made on the same day. When he heard that Stalingrad was boxed in, he immediately ordered that the city was to be held at all costs. He has just handed down a death sentence for the 6th Army. The German invaders will be sacrificed in the Kessel of Stalingrad. Early morning. 19th of November 1942. In the vast expanse of the plains to the west of Stalingrad, World War II is about to take a turn for the worse. More than a million Red Army soldiers are waiting for the command to cast a noose of steel round the German 6th Army. Stalin has sent his best man to lead this operation, Marshal Grigory Shuikov. Whenever Zhukov appeared, there was bound to be a big battle. And that's what the men all used to say back then. We were all aware of that. So when he showed up in our midst, we knew things would soon start. And we were right. It didn't take very long before we got orders to attack. Marshal Grigory Zhuikov has learned from his army's mistakes. After defending Russia for more than a year, the Red Army is now ready to go on the offensive. Since August, Hitler's Sixth Army has been waiting at Stalingrad on the Volga. This is the longest river in Europe. It forms the boundary with Asia. More than 2,700 kilometers from Berlin, the German soldiers fear the winter and the wide open spaces, but underestimate the enemy. Until then, the Sixth Army had been used to winning every battle. So we never thought it possible that the enemy would carry out a pincer movement and surround us like that. At first, we simply couldn't believe that we'd come to the end of the line. But we had. For many, this is a completely new experience. Instead of a quick victory, there is only the odd isolated skirmish. In November 1942, there is not much troop movement on the Volga battlefront. The ice and the freezing weather keep the soldiers busy. Most of them are still unaware of what lies ahead. But on the Russian side of the Volga, the Red Army is itching for a fight. At first, we were worried that the big offensive attack would be postponed because of bad weather. There was thick fog. But when the moment came, we all opened fire. 
The Kachushas, our multiple rocket launchers, fired the first shots, and then we immediately joined in with our weapons. The preparation for battle lasted only 80 minutes. That's all the time we were given to get ready before we moved out. The attack is launched shortly after 5.30 German time. A barrage of 3,500 guns makes the earth tremble 50 kilometers away. Zhuikov's decisive battle has been well planned. I'm telling you that cannonade was incredible. Never before or after in my entire life have I heard anything like that. Hundreds and hundreds of heavy artillery pieces and Katyusha multiple rocket launchers were creating an inferno. We could see it because they weren't firing at us. The Russians were concentrating on the Romanian divisions immediately next to us on our flank. That was our weakest point. The Romanians. This is all that remains of the Romanian army after the battle. Their government has sent them to take part in Hitler's plundering raid, and these Romanian soldiers have paid the highest price. But even the Soviet victors have suffered heavy losses. The Red Army's infantrymen advanced in open formation. And their commander rode behind them on horseback. He looked just like a sheepdog driving a flock of sheep in front of him, the way he rode that horse. The German artillery creates a bloodbath. The commander went wild. He drew his pistol and drove the next division to the front. Since our artillery battery's first salvo had already hit home, it was no problem. I don't think many shots were fired, maybe as few as 10 rounds. And after that, they were all dead. Zhuikov surprises the Germans with an old strategy. His tanks strike at the enemy's vulnerable rear. The Russians overrun the expanse between the Volga and the Donau. The relative strengths of the forces have changed significantly. By the 19th of November, our army had a total of only 80 tanks in good running order. A few were being repaired and were soon ready to join in the battle. Nevertheless, at any moment in time, we had a maximum of only 100 tanks that were in operation. But the Russians had lined up 1,200 brand new T-34s against us. The Russian Empire has unparalleled resources. In the east, behind the Ural Mountains, hundreds of new armaments factories are built, seemingly out of thin air. In just three days, the pincer movement succeeds as two Soviet wedge formations meet at Kalach on the Donau. Roughly 300,000 German and Romanian soldiers are immobilized at Stalingrad, trapped in a noose of steel. This is a reenactment of the moment when the two Soviet armies met, performed and filmed for propaganda purposes. The moment is full of military pathos. From the start, German soldiers caught in the unrelenting Russian noose realize they are heading for disaster. One man writes to his wife. My darling Magdalena, I'm writing this letter in an attempt 
a final attempt to make contact with the outside world. The past couple of days were horrifying. Many know what is in store for them. We were scared that they would do to us exactly what we had done to hundreds and thousands of Russians up to that time during the campaign. And I'm not exaggerating the numbers. That really happened. That really was the case. We were scared of being trapped ourselves and scared of avenging Russian soldiers. At that time in the war, both sides had become completely ruthless. We knew what was going to happen to us all right. There would be no quarter. Twenty second of November, nineteen forty two. While Hitler relaxes at Berchtesgaden, his fortified retreat in the Alps, his fate is being decided in the east. When he receives the bad news from the Volga, the Fuhrer orders General Friedrich Paulus, commander of the Sixth Army, to maintain his position at Stalingrad no matter what. Even the renowned Field Marshal Manstein who is immediately ordered to the front, does not yet realize the seriousness of the situation. But other army commanders despair and advise Hitler to order Paulus to break out of the Stalingrad pocket. They nearly succeed. Hitler One memorable Zeitler evening, Hitler, Zeitzler and Heusinger talked for hours on end. I don't know till what time, probably 2 a.m. Zeitzler urged the Führer to immediately withdraw the 6th Army. But the next morning, Goering said that the Air Force could sustain our men in Russia with supplies of at least 500 tons, and Hitler promptly decided to stick to his guns. The Germans would stay at Stalingrad. Göring has made a crucial mistake. His Air Force mobilizes all its men, but they are unable to provide the huge amount of supplies needed at Stalingrad. The men caught in the Kessel are living on empty promises. All kinds of rumors were going about among the soldiers at Stalingrad. But the men were placated with the comforting but irresponsible slogan, Stick it out. The Führer will get us out. The Luftwaffe gets food, fuel, and ammunition through to Stalingrad, but many planes are shot down. The planes also bring letters from home. Letters from home were a link to relatives, the last and incredibly important link that gave the men, some were still mere boys, who fought far away from their loved ones, hope, and motivated them to continue fighting. The letters written by the men caught in the Russian trap are some of the most moving documents. They give an insight into the tragedy. One officer tries to reassure his wife. The situation is turning in our favor, but of course, all good things take time. What are our darling children up to? I can still see them standing on the stairs, waving goodbye to me. At the moment, the Russian commander seems to be making a real effort to break us down. But the addressee suspects that the truth is much worse. You don't write a letter full of despair to a pregnant woman. He just knew somehow that the baby would be born on his birthday, and that was what happened. The young mother is expecting her fourth child. Her husband comes home on leave in the autumn of 1942, but by the beginning of December, he is back in Stalingrad. When my husband left, we knew the situation was desperate. It was difficult to say goodbye because neither of us knew what the future had in store. In wartime, this is the fate of millions. Every goodbye is a tragedy, and there is no way to escape it. We were powerless. We couldn't say, I don't like this, this isn't for me. Those are things that are inconceivable to today's young people. We simply had to accept our fate. 
Her husband has no choice. He has to return to the Kessel. On the Russian side, there is a tremendous will to win the war, fired on by the belief that socialism is superior. Ultimately, the Russian generals are all loyal to the party line. Heroism like this is only possible in a country like ours, our Russia, because the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is a nation where people were shaped by men such as Lenin and Stalin, a country where the nation was forged into a unified, monolithic and invincible collective. We never doubted our country, Mother Russia. Not for one single second. Russia is a huge country, and so many enemies have tried to defeat us in the past. But no one has ever succeeded. So we never, ever had a shadow of a doubt. Not in the slightest. The success of the first days leaves the Red Army soldiers in high spirits, and in many cases drunk as well. In several places, they come across military equipment and food depots and help themselves to German supplies. The Perlazovsky, which lies between Stalingrad and Kalachi, we took a German corps by surprise and confiscated their whole supply of food. Yes, of course, we drank a lot. I don't have to hide that. Drinking vodka is a Russian tradition, isn't it? The enemy had really good food. We were used to eating only mash, but there we found some real delicacies. And we even drank French wines and cognac. Stalin is adamant that the 6th Army has to be annihilated completely before the Germans get a chance to launch a counteroffensive. But Shuikov knows that by now the German army is far too weak for that. He is planning something even bigger, to cut off the entire German army in the south. I can still remember how happy I was, and all my friends and comrades, when we heard that our two fronts had joined up with each other and managed to surround the whole German 6th Army. We all knew that they would never be able to get out of Stalingrad, no matter how much help they had from their comrades back in Germany. For the first German captives, the war has come to an end, but that is hardly any reason to heave a sigh of relief. Did I feel any sympathy for the German soldiers? Of course not. How could I feel sorry for them? Once, when I was on duty, wearing my weapon, I saw some German prisoners who were carrying an injured man. I told them, you fools, you had no business coming here to Russia. The Germans were filthy, wrapped in rags. How could I feel sorry for them? Who invited them to our country? Hatred breeds more hatred, but not only the Germans notice this as the days go by. The hardships of war also have an effect on the ordinary Red Army soldiers. Life had no value whatsoever at the front. Today you're lying next to your friend, and tomorrow you have to bury him. After one particularly fierce attack, only 10 of our 120 men remained. On both sides, the combatants' determination is beginning to wane. To keep up the Soviet Army's fighting power, officers enforce iron discipline and take brutal measures. Once, 
We urgently needed a messenger to go to the front line. A captain walked into our shelter and told one soldier, You there, get dressed and go outside. The man had just returned from guard duty and had taken off his coat. No, I'm not going, he said. What was that? The captain barked. I said, no, I'm not going anywhere now. What did you say? Come outside with me. The two men went outside and the captain drew his pistol. A German parabellum and said, are you going now? No, I'm not, I said. Are you going? No, I'm not. Captain fired a shot above his head. But still, the soldier said, I'm not going. He is quite an old man, and he was exhausted and had no strength left. The soldier said, I can't go anywhere now. I've just come off guard duty. I'm too tired. I've had it. So the captain shot him there and then for refusing to obey an order. And he came back into our shelter and said, Go outside, dig a hole in the ground and bury him. And that's what we had to do. Both sides suffered terribly. A German artillery officer writes home, At night we freeze. How much longer do we still have to sleep in the open? Our bodies won't last much longer. Not to mention the dirt and the lice. Gradually, the people at home realize what the men stationed at the Volga have to endure. He wrote, Think of me. Think of me all the time, just as I'm thinking of you. That gave him strength. He told me that in a letter. Think of me. It gives me the strength to bear all this. Gerhard Kolak is a tank driver at Stalingrad, doomed to die. He does not mince his words and is very open with his wife. He wanted to keep the last bullet for himself. He refused to be taken prisoner. I used to say to him, and what about us? What will become of us here under Hitler? Officially, Hitler never utters a word about the drama at Stalingrad. The weekly newsreels lead everyone to believe that things are fine and the reports from the armed forces don't say anything about the battle or Chuikov's pincer movement, which will eventually turn the tide of war back on Germany. Letters from Stalingrad are censored or withheld when necessary. But nonetheless, rumors are rife in the fatherland. The fate of 300,000 men cannot be hushed up. Inside the Stalingrad pocket, which the Germans called the Kessel, the cauldron, supply shortages are claiming more victims than the battle. The thermometer drops to minus 20 degrees. Extreme cold and hunger combine to weaken the soldiers. In other words, it was sheer misery for the ground troops in the Stalingrad Kessel. As part of my duties, I had to go into the shelters and decide which men were still capable of fighting. It made my stomach turn to see that filth, that much agony. I turned around, went outside again and said, I'm sorry, I can't execute my order. The major asked me why I couldn't do it and I told him to go in there and see for himself. He came back out and vomited after what he'd witnessed inside that shelter. The wounded and sick have little chance of survival, and on top of that, there's the epidemic of typhus. I had the bad luck to get typhoid fever in 1941, and the good luck to survive it. And then the damn thing got a hold of me a second time at Stalingrad in 1943. That meant that I had to get out from underneath the tank every 20 or 30 minutes to pass blood. When you've got typhoid fever, you stink to high heaven, and you're highly infectious and we were lying close to each other. It was terrible. In all this dreadful misery, there is no time for mercy. Someone would come to me, point at a dead comrade and say, look, Lieutenant, look at those red spots on his skin. We'd apply pressure to the skin, and if any dents remained, we knew. It was typhus. So what were we to do? 
Two or three of us would quickly carry the man to the riverbank and throw him in. We had to do it like that before his body had the chance to infect the rest of us with the contagion. I never thought horse meat could taste that good. Hunger hurts. Last year we laughed at the Red Army when they slaughtered and ate their horses. These days we don't leave the Russians anything. For the first time since Napoleon's Russian campaign, German soldiers are starving to death. As a medical officer, I had to draw up a report every 10 days about our losses, the men's state of health, etc., etc. It was submitted to the regimental doctor and the divisional doctor as well. Once after I had reported that two men had died of starvation, I was immediately called in. My superior was furious with me. No soldiers ever died of starvation in the German army. I told him that he was sadly mistaken. Maybe it had never happened before in the German army. But now, it was different. By mid-December, more than 1,000 men are dying every day at Stalingrad. They are killed in the heat of battle and also by hunger and typhus. In most cases, their relatives are still informed personally of their deaths. I had to notify the fallen soldiers' families. It was a very difficult task for me to accomplish because I didn't know the soldiers who had fallen at Stalingrad. And I didn't know whether they'd even been buried or not. So I would write to the families. Regrettably, I have to inform you that your son has fallen in service of his Führer, his people, and his fatherland. I would then add that the only consolation I could offer was that he was killed by a shot in the head, or that he didn't suffer, or something like that. The Russians are confident of victory. To persuade German soldiers to defect, the Soviet propaganda unit, supported by German communists, starts to target the 6th Army. Then it started, around the clock, non-stop, monotonous broadcasts. Stalingrad, mass grave. Stalingrave, mass grave. We heard that 24 hours a day. The loudspeaker says, every seven seconds a German soldier dies in Russia at Stalingrad, mass grave. But this psychological terror does not have the desired effect. We didn't believe it. We simply didn't believe it. It just wasn't the truth. It was like... Well, how can I put it? For us, what that voice said just wasn't valid. It was the voice of the enemy. The voice of the enemy. The men fear a Russian revenge as the propaganda continues. Special propaganda troops are detailed, but even they lack the necessary conviction. The Soviet propaganda and the Russian call for the anti-fascist Germans to defect to the Red Army didn't achieve very much at all. Only a few men ended up coming over to our side. Just a few. A German soldier writes to his wife. I'll be honest with you, my love. Only a miracle can save us now. Don't let fate get you down. Go on being so brave for the sake of our two boys. The only thing that kept us going through that awful time was the beautiful Madonna of Stalingrad. A few days before Christmas, a medical officer had found some pencils and made a drawing of her on the back of a Russian card. Gert Reuber, a doctor and theologian, draws the Madonna that gave hope to those who were doomed to die. He will die later in 1944 in Russian captivity. That drawing and its message spread through our ranks like wildfire. 
It gave us new hope, hope that things might still improve. Light, life, love, that was the Madonna of Stalingrad's message, a message from another world. By the end of November 1942, Hitler returns to Volshansa, his East Prussian headquarters. He still refuses to relent. He will not allow the 6th Army to back out. The Romanian Marshal Antonescu is summoned to the Council of War. Members of the Alliance are at odds with each other and recriminations are flying about. Who is responsible for this catastrophe? In the end, they decide on a final battle of liberation. Field Marshal Manstein is to lead this operation. What I found unfortunate about Manstein was that he never bothered to go to Stalingrad personally, which was a great pity. Of course it was dangerous. But he could have gone there and should have as the commanding field marshal. I feel he should have taken a personal interest. Then he would have seen the terrible state of the soldiers who were caught in the Russians' trap and how low the 6th Army had sunk. Manstein is to command a relief army, the Hoth Tank Division, to break the Kessel. They call it Operation Winter Storm. At the time, the planes were freezing cold. At first everything was just frozen up, but then the snow also came. Thick snow began to fall. Eventually, everything was covered in snow, but we still had to report for duty. The rescue mission has three divisions, only one of them newly equipped. They don't have enough fuel or air support. The army has no reserves left, but initially everyone is confident, especially since they have a new type of tank, the Tiger, which is considered to be superior to the Soviet T-34. The men from the tank division know what is expected of them. We knew that some 300,000 men of the 6th Army were waiting for us. They were relying on us utterly. They knew that we were on our way and they were pinning all their hopes on us. We were to save them. We were their last resort. At first, the Hoth division makes good progress. The Red Army is taken by surprise. It has hardly any troops southwest of Stalingrad. But then things change. The German tank division is too weak. 60 kilometers before reaching Stalingrad, they come to a halt. 60 kilometers between survival and defeat. Not a great distance for a whole tank division. Liberation seems to be within their grasp. The tanks in the front fired flares to show our trapped countrymen that we were on our way to rescue them. Suddenly, hope stirs inside the Kessel. We saw the flares and we heard the artillery fire. You can hear very well at minus 40 degrees. In that crystal clear weather, you can hear everything. The breakout seems imminent. The excited Germans burn most of their possessions, determined not to leave anything to the enemy. But this soon proves to have been an over-hasty decision. Everything was burning. There were flames everywhere. And then came the command. We're staying. Many troops even burnt their thick coats. We'd been issued with winter coats that were lined and rather long. The men grabbed their coats and threw them into the fire because they said they'd be able to run much faster with only their uniforms on. There was no doubt in their minds that they were finally going to get out of the Kessel at last.
But within the ranks of the general staff, the situation is more realistically assessed. By around the 19th of December, we were told that the breakout wasn't going to happen and that we had to return to our old dugouts. And then it was clear, at least it was completely clear to me, that the end was near. It was simply a question of when it would finally come. But on the front, the illusion lasts longer. At night, we could hear the battle sounds from where we were in the castle. In those wide open spaces and with that kind of cold, you can hear very clearly. After Christmas, the sounds moved further and further away. And then we no longer heard anything. That's when we knew, even though we weren't officially informed, that we wouldn't be able to break out of Stalingrad. It is now the 23rd of December, and Manstein is forced to pull back his tank division. Further north, a new Soviet attack has been launched. Germany's entire eastern front is in danger, and Manstein is not the only one to understand what this means. Of course, it was obvious that the occupying troops at Stalingrad were left in the lurch. They were sacrificed, a senseless sacrifice. The divisions that are supposed to be the saviors suffer heavy losses. Their mission ends in disaster and they are plagued by feelings of guilt. We felt like traitors. Our aim had been to get them out of there, but we failed. We simply couldn't do it. Many, many years have passed since that time. But to this day, I don't celebrate on Christmas Eve. I simply cannot do it. At home, a brave face is put on. The weekly newsreel soothes the nation. Protected by a strong front, our homeland can prepare for its fourth Christmas while at war. But most Germans lack the festive spirit. Despite an official news embargo on Stalingrad, defense force informers report grave concern among citizens. By the Volga, the atmosphere is one of despair. There is no peace to celebrate. The mood was bleak. Everyone was depressed. We just sat there and sang a few Christmas carols. Many of our comrades cried as they looked at pictures of their families. On Christmas Eve 1942, the Third Reich's official radio station plays Silent Night for all the armed forces. Then the station crosses over live to the various units that are far away from their homes and loved ones. First, the Navy vessels in the English Channel are hailed. Then the submarine crews in the Atlantic. Then the men fighting in the snow high up in the mountains. And finally, the almost forgotten troops at Stalingrad, where Christmas 1942 is spent in limbo between life and death. It was a very clear night. The moon was incredibly clear. It was eerie. And the Russians left us alone. There were only occasional shots on Christmas Eve. In der Weihnachtsnacht und für mich war for me that Christmas was heavenly. I felt there was a bridge that stretched over the entire earth. The starry night and the moon, the same moon that my family could see in Germany. konnten. 
Most of us knew the end was near and we wrote farewell letters, hoping that they would be delivered to our people. All we thought of was home. Back home, 300,000 families fear for their loved ones, fathers, sons, husbands, sweethearts, brothers. While German propaganda paints a scene of Christmas trees and bright lights, the 6th Army at Stalingrad reports that 60 men have died of starvation. At the Volga, the Empire's official Christmas greetings are no longer welcome. The Führer's Christmas gift was supposed to be a parcel containing gingerbread or something and cigarettes and... I don't know what else. With a postcard saying, greetings from the Führer, or something ridiculous like that. But by the time it reached us in our shelters, all that remained were three cigarettes and a few sweets. On Christmas Day, the following entry is made in the 6th Army's war diary. For the past 48 hours, we have received no supplies. We are running out of food and fuel. Our men are fast losing their strength. A general writes to his wife. Of course, Christmas was no fun. In times like these, one shouldn't celebrate. You can't expect people to be happy under these circumstances. The general is Friedrich Paulus. While in charge at Stalingrad, he will be promoted to the rank of field marshal. At Christmas, we ate horse meat. We dug up some horses from under the snow. We all knew where the dead horses were. We cut off chunks of flesh and made ourselves meatballs. Horse meatballs. That was our Christmas meal. At Christmas time, many German soldiers fall prey to Soviet shock troops. We liked their Christmas. It was a perfect time to go looting. We always came back with lots of gifts. Sausage, jam, small Christmas trees. We took whatever we could get and we never felt bad about it. After all, the Germans had the words God with us engraved on their belt buckles. They were religious people. The festival of love. Here it has long since turned into blind hatred. Both sides show no mercy to the enemy. For many, Christmas becomes a turning point. Christmas was the final straw, the turning point. After Christmas, people no longer said, the Führer will get us out of here. The men just kept quiet or they moaned and cursed, but that was always dangerous. In the army, disrespect could get you a death sentence, especially during war, and especially in a place like Stalingrad. There are still some civilians left inside the castle, more than 10,000 of them. The Soviets did not evacuate them, and the Germans don't take any care of them. These people are robbed of their bare essentials. 
Once the Kessel was closed, I had the unfortunate task of going to the Russian civilians and commandeering their wooden houses. We continued doing that to the very end. Every time my men and I set out in our lorries, we could no longer use tanks, to go and commandeer two horses for our forces. We took along some extra bits and pieces we had, especially things for the children. The only people left in the area were children and old people. I always took them something, even if it was only a piece of chocolate to show them that we weren't as evil as they quite rightfully thought we were. We had no choice but to take their houses. It was for our own survival. The freezing hell of Stalingrad will claim more than 700,000 lives. Germans, Russians, soldiers, civilians. Every death is a tragedy. And still there are officers who give their soldiers orders to perform heinous crimes. An officer ordered me to shoot a young Russian soldier. I refused and told him to do it himself but he was too much of a coward to shoot the young man. He wanted me to do his dirty work. I didn't budge. I wasn't prepared to do it. The officer saw he was losing face. He turned around and marched off. I called the Russian and said he was free to go. He was so grateful that he knelt at my tank and prayed. The Russian realized that he had to get away fast, and he scurried away, hopping like a rabbit. But he had no chance of escaping. The officer saw him and simply ordered someone else to shoot him. An infantryman raised his machine gun and fired. The Russian made a few somersaults and then ended up on the ground, dead. That is the fate of many prisoners. Too often their lives end like that. But everyone has a different experience. The first Germans who came to our house were fine, but later on they treated us badly. The first time three Germans came to our house, I was only six years old. I went to hide under the bed. The captain had a chocolate in his hand. I still remember that very clearly. The chocolate was filled with rum. He gave it to me. I don't know where he got it from. When the youngest soldier, his name was Walter, lay down on the bed to have a rest. I was allowed to play with his rifle. But early in the new year, the Urizov family also lands in dire straits. The inhabitants were ordered to collect all their warm things and give them to the Germans. Blankets, hot water, bottles, food. They took everything. They left us nothing. All that remained was a bit of food. Still, there are islands of humanity in the middle of an inferno. The captain often showed us his pictures. There was a picture of his wife and children. He showed them to my mother and me. We were surprised to see that the Germans also had factories like ours. Walter never showed us any pictures. New Year's Day 1943, and the Germans are waiting for the end. But the propaganda machine continues to spout lies. Josef Goebbels' New Year speech is full of patriotic rhetoric. Deep in enemy territory, our soldiers are keeping watch. Not even the infernal fury and stubborn determination of the wild brutes of the East will shake them. If until now anyone has doubted that we can and will ultimately be victorious, our nation has come up with the most persuasive proof. 
A nation that can survive trials and tribulations like these is surely destined for a great future. For the men at Stalingrad, this is sheer scorn. We were glorified, even though we were still alive. We weren't all dead yet, by no means. There were still hundreds, in fact thousands of us. And that was an incredible insult to us. To the west of Stalingrad, the Red Army is advancing relentlessly. Tatsinskaya, the most important airfield for the German airlift of supplies into the Kessel, is attacked. More than 70 transport aircraft are lost on the ground. Goering's promise to keep sending supplies by air dissolves into utter despair. In the later stages, things became completely chaotic. While an aeroplane was taking off, men would be running after it on the runway, trying desperately to escape from the Kessel. Fifty thousand wounded soldiers are evacuated by air, but tens of thousands are left behind. The planes have no room for all of them. Terrible scenes took place at the airfields. Ordinary soldiers were no longer allowed near the aeroplanes, but some pushed their way through, and when there was no space inside, they hung onto the planes, to the wheels or the wings. When the aeroplane took off, they were taken along, but by the time it reached 300 or 400 meters, they fell because they were frozen stiff and couldn't hold on any longer. Stalingrad's airfields are the gateway to survival, but the way there is a road of death. There were bomb craters everywhere and they were full of dead soldiers covered with snow. I ran around for a while and then I found a bunker 300 meters from there. Inside the bunker, there were a couple of medics. I asked them to let me in, but they wouldn't, until I told them I still had a hand grenade left. Then they opened the bunker and let me in. There were a lot of wounded men inside. One of them was from Essen, and he said he wasn't going to go back to the airfield again. He'd spent the entire night outside, freezing and waiting to be airlifted back to Germany. But it was to no avail. There were too many injured soldiers, and the planes took off again seconds after landing. But I wasn't going to be put off by his story. Hans Rostovitz eventually makes it to the airfield at Gumrak. Suddenly, an aeroplane landed and roared towards us. It stopped 10 meters ahead of me. The door opened, a couple of crates and a few bags were thrown out. By then, we were at the door. I was still trying to explain that I had a head injury, but the man just shouted, Get in! Get in! Seventeen of us scrambled in. The door was slammed shut, the engine started, and the plane was ready to leave again. I noticed that the runway was quite bumpy, but before I could get worried, we had already taken off. <laughs> Those who are not wounded have no chance of being airlifted, and for thousands there remains only one way out of the castle. Stick with me, I said, and I'll see if I can find a place where we can sneak through. But he just shook his head and said, Thanks for everything you've done. You spent so much time trying to help me, trying to talk me out of it, but I can't stand this any longer. Then I knew, when he raised his pistol and shook my hand without saying a word, then I knew this was the end for him. In some German units, there are even cases of cannibalism, 
desperation triumphs over humanity. I witnessed with my own eyes how German soldiers butchered a well-fed paymaster shortly after he died. They ripped out his lungs and liver. By then, things had become so bad and ordinary, normal people were so desperate that they simply lost their minds. The Red Army keeps pulling the noose of steel tighter and tighter round the Germans. This is no longer a battle, merely an execution. Death becomes anonymous and there are no more letters of condolence to the fatherland and no graves. In a way, we felt sorry for them, because at the time, we were well-dressed. We had fur jackets and felt shoes. We were well-fed. On a number of occasions, I saw our soldiers giving the Germans some bread. It is now the 8th of January, and the Soviet negotiators call for Paulus to surrender. But he has strict orders from Hitler to fight to the last bullet. The reason? The Fuhrer believes that the 6th Army is still capable of keeping the Soviet forces occupied and therefore of holding the Eastern Front. Why was Zhukov and the Red Army's offer to surrender turned down on the 8th of January? Why were the peace negotiators chased away with shots? In the end, only 6,000 of us came back alive from Stalingrad. But it could have been many more, at least 10 times more, if not 20. Early in January, a soldier writes home. Dear mother, don't worry about me. The castle is wide. There are at least 200,000 men in here, and we're doing everything we can to straighten things out again. It was delusion and blindness that led the Germans into this catastrophe, and now the senseless deaths will continue. The worst is yet to come. The Battle of Stalingrad has lasted 53 days. By the city on the Volga River, 240,000 German soldiers are caught in a trap. Their powers are exhausted and rescue is a vain hope. On the 8th of January, 1943, the Red Army offers the Germans the opportunity to make an honorable surrender. But Hitler forbids them to negotiate, and the Russian offer is rejected. The way I saw it, it was just like a doctor coming to see a patient on his deathbed, and then going off without giving the sick man the slightest hope. In a nutshell, leaving him to face death. That's what it seemed like to me. Two days later, the 6th Army is expecting the final stroke. On the 10th, we were in trouble from what I observed through my field glasses. A report of the infantry was advancing, hundreds and thousands of them, and tanks. I couldn't count them, there were at least 50, maybe even more. And my battery commander said, hey, 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 didn't you count them? Seven Soviet armies close in on the Stalingrad pocket, and 200,000 men overrun the German positions. The exhausted men can no longer fight back effectively. 
The Russian armor broke through. I don't know how it happened in detail, but they literally overran our position. Then turned and came back again to crush the soldiers in the trenches. The tanks kept coming at us. We couldn't run very fast in the snow, so they simply ran over the ones who were there, who couldn't get away. There were soldiers lying there. One of them had lost his legs and was crying, shoot me, go on, shoot me, shoot me. And all we could do was to stand there, not moving, and just look at him. You couldn't take your own kit along with you, not if you were helping a wounded man to get away. It was simply not possible to carry both, so you had to leave your stuff behind. The Red Army comes rolling in from the west, over the icy steppes. Thousands flee to the riverbank and the ruins of the fallen city. The Germans call their diminishing ground the Kessel, the cauldron. What we have been through in the last few days is indescribable. There is still worse to come, misery, defeat, and death. The families of the majority who die here are never sent an exact notification. So if you never receive notification, then you should assume that I have either been wounded, taken prisoner, or died of hunger and cold. This is something of a farewell note. I don't know how many more days we can hold out. In a bid to bring the horror to an end, an officer will be flown to Germany. The man chosen is the highly decorated Captain Winrich Beer. And he told me, Beer, we've decided to send you back to Hitler. We must do something to make him see what's going on here. And that will give us some room to negotiate. Paulus was raising the subject of a surrender, a capitulation, on the grounds that, as he said, it no longer made any sense to keep men there, starving and freezing in the cold. Beer's mission is the last desperate approach to the high command in an attempt to save lives. On the 14th of January, the officer arrives at the Fuhrer's headquarters, the Wolf's Lair. He knows that Hitler will not be easily won over. Then the door opened and Herr Hitler entered and came up to me saying, Heil, Herr Hauptmann. And I stood to attention and replied, Heil, mein Führer. Then he said, come with me. We went through a door into that famous room. And I plucked up my courage and said, mein Führer, I have orders from my commanding general to give you a report and to make a request of you. And now may I carry out my orders. Keitel was present, and I saw him nod. So then Hitler said, yes. And I must admit that he let me talk for the next three hours. He didn't interrupt or hinder me while I was giving my report or during the discussion. But the decision has been made long before. Stalingrad must be held, no matter what the cost for the sake of prestige and because it's named after Hitler's enemy, Stalin. And that's why the pitiless tyrant will sacrifice a multitude. Of course, I was angry. I was absolutely furious. Anyway, you could clearly see what people were saying, that Hitler had completely lost contact with reality. Hitler condemns his soldiers to neglect, suffering, and hunger. 50 grams of bread, that's the daily ration. The temperature drops to minus 50 degrees Celsius. The cold is their greatest adversary. It claims more victims than enemy action. 
We had nothing out there on the battlefield, cowering in our foxholes. It was all over, wasn't it? And it was awful, and we couldn't even light a fire at night in case we were spotted. And the everlasting cold was terribly depressing. Thank God. At the time, I had decent winter clothing. Otherwise, I would have frozen to death on the first night. A rat can dig in. An animal burrows into the earth for shelter. But men cannot do that. There's nothing more to say apart from the fact that misery and weakness have combined to break us. The lice still find something to eat on men whose ribs are showing. Oh, if only our suffering would come to an end. Many soldiers can no longer take the stress. Men started going crazy. They would scream, hit themselves, or even foam at the mouth. Some of them would fall on the snow during attacks and do other strange things. In that place, madness could overcome you in the blink of an eye. To be wounded is to suffer the most gruesome fate of all. In the cellars of the city lie 40,000 injured men. They receive no care at all. The cellars were full of wounded men, severely wounded, feverish, dying. It stank like the plague in there. The odor was so clinging. It was, how shall I put it? It was like a charnel house where the bodies were still alive. There was a field surgical hospital set up in this factory building, which is where I witnessed the suffering. You can't describe it in detail. If you were to tell anything of what you had seen, but I don't like to do that, because it would be too upsetting. In a tiny back room in the cellars lay cavalry captain St. Paul. Shrapnel had destroyed his cranium and the throbbing brain was exposed. Both his thighs were broken and he was in a highly agitated state. Shouting orders which disturbed the other 300 patients. They were more or less calmly waiting for their lives to end. Not one of the 300 had the slightest prospect of staying alive. It's not only the Germans who are suffering. This January, in the ruins of the city, there are still thousands of civilians in a daily battle for survival. So long as it wasn't too cold outside, the Russian women and the German troops would go out and cut meat off the dead horses. When the horses were all eaten, they moved on to eating dogs and cats after that. When there was nothing left to eat, then, please excuse me, they would cut slices off the buttocks of frozen corpses. Cannibalism is common at Stalingrad. The Russians and the Germans are guilty of it, without exception. The Soviet prisoners in the Kessel also eat human flesh. There was a camp where several thousand wounded, starving Russian prisoners were held. They either went mad or took to eating human flesh. 
The Germans couldn't look after the prisoners at all, for they were at death's door themselves. For the German troops, the airfields at Pitomnik and Gumrak offer the last hope. On the 23rd of January, planes come in one by one to evacuate the wounded. There were wounded men in great suffering on either side of the runway. There was a fellow with a Christ-like face. He was older than me and seemed nice. He told me, come on, I'll put my right arm around your shoulder. As he was holding me like that, I saw that he was badly wounded with a hole in his right lower chest. He had a woolen sock shoved in it. You can't imagine what it was like, for the sock kept falling out. And he would take it, this bloody lump, and push it back in. At last, we came to a field dressing station, and he collapsed. Alongside the wounded are specialists who are also waiting to be evacuated. These specialized military staff are destined to escape. The commanding general of my Panzer Corps was ordered out of the Kessel by the Führer on the 18th of January. On the 19th of January, I had to drive him in a half-track to the Gumrock airstrip where he took his leave of us. I can remember it to this day. He never said a word. It was weird. It was traumatic, and I must say that I still cannot understand myself even now. I couldn't summon up the courage to say to the general, can't you take me with you? Conditions at the airfield are becoming more chaotic. The Junkers 52 arrived. We should have been loaded into the aircraft by medics. But here's what happened instead. Four high-ranking officers turned up. Well-fed, in white fur coats, each of them carrying a machine pistol, saying that they were acting on the Führer's orders and that we'd have to miss out. The doctor on the plane told them that it was reserved for wounded evacuees, but they kicked him off. I saw it with my own eyes. Yes, they were laughing at us. They got on that aircraft and forced the pilot to fly them out without taking a single wounded soldier with them. That's the truth. Only a few will escape the coming inferno. Then suddenly, people started charging toward that plane over the snow. Wounded, non-wounded, and, and what have you. The brutality was unsurpassed. You see, there was only one escape route left. No crew members were willing to leave the aircraft, and they wouldn't be taken off it. If there was no other way out of the situation, the pilot would rev up and... Taxing the plane away. Indescribable scenes were being played out back there. It was completely chaotic. They were pushing the wounded in, pushing more and more of them in. There were plenty of them lying about already. And to make it worse, the Russians were shelling the airfield. Pilot said, I've got to get going. We taxied down the runway, but the aircraft wouldn't leave the ground. There were soldiers hanging on all over the plane, right and left. 
especially on the undercarriage. Those who had managed to cling. There was nothing for it but to make the plane swerve from side to side until they were all shaken off. They had to start again. And that was the most terrible moment. I can never forget the noise the starter motors were making. Boom, boom, boom. Until the engines caught and ran smoothly so the plane could take off. That's when I passed out. Then the then the pilot took the aircraft up high, maybe as high as 2,000 meters. And then we broke through the cloud cover. And it was such a wonder for me to be out in the sunlight. Suddenly, it was all brightness. I began to feel that my life had been given back to me. You can hardly imagine what it was like. And I still cannot grasp the reality. Things were so different. After cold and hunger and misery, bullets and shells, and the screams of wounded men, Suddenly, there you are in a nice warm bed, with food to eat. And when a nurse first came to feed me my soup from a tin bowl, I cried without any embarrassment. I was carried onto a train for the wounded, which was headed not for home, but for Poland. Hitler wanted to keep the wounded soldiers out of Germany. We were undernourished, you see, and that didn't look so good. So then, I ended up in a military hospital in Zakopane. I only came back to Germany some months later, to the eye clinic at Halle, where Professor Dr. Klause operated on me and removed shell splinters from my cheek. They were embedded in my cheek, but it was only after 30 months that I came home to Germany on leave. In wintry Germany, the fate of the 6th Army is largely unknown. The propaganda machine makes the situation seem less serious than it actually is, and news reports refer only to heavy fighting along the Volga. By now, many people no longer place any trust in the official bulletins. We had no idea that the Germans were surrounded. And in January, at the end of January, I did what could have got me into serious trouble. I tuned into the BBC from England. I heard do 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 the notes from Beethoven's Fifth. I heard them saying, this is England, this is England. The Sixth Army in Stalingrad has been left to its fate. It was terrible. I sank onto a chair and thought to myself, I can't understand it. You know, who can grasp a thing like that? It was so shattering. I love you so much that I cannot forbid you to find another man, since you are much too young to spend the rest of your life alone. With all my heart, I hope that you'll be able to find another man to bring you luck and happiness, just as I tried to do. In my final moments, I am grateful as I think back to the day I first got to know you. That farewell letter from Stalingrad will never reach the woman who was waiting for it. There was a fear, a general fear that everyone had, including me. We were all afraid that the Russians would take no prisoners, that the Russians would shoot all of us.
I couldn't bring myself to commit suicide. I said to myself, I'm far too young for that sort of thing at 22. Yes, you have to say that it would have been a crime to kill yourself. And the lieutenant of the first section ordered us to save the last bullet for ourselves. Later, as a prisoner, I bumped into this gentleman, and if I hadn't been in such a weakened state, I would have most likely given him a clout. In the final days of January, the Red Army cuts the Kessel into two small pockets. The German commanders continue to follow Hitler's orders and fight on. I didn't see them as fascists, but I took a certain pleasure in their plight. Serves you right, I thought. That's how we felt at the time. General Paulus and his staff take refuge in the basement of a department store. Although it makes little sense to fight on, only a few high-ranking officers are in favor of laying down their arms. One of these men struggles to get into the headquarters, Captain Gerhard Dengler. First of all, I nearly passed out from the reek of cigar smoke, brandy and cooked meat. Then I was angry, and the thought occurred to me that we were out there eating human flesh, while in headquarters they still had meat to grill. They can still get luxuries such as brandy, and they have nice food to eat. And I said, why shouldn't we capitulate? Paulus answered me, he said, you've got it easy, Captain. All you have to do is look for the enemy and the whites of their eyes. But here, in the 6th Army headquarters, I've got to make highly strategic decisions. I didn't understand him at all. I simply took it as a cowardly excuse and began to lose my temper. Paulus noticed that I was angry and suddenly remarked, Yes, Herr Captain, now that the moment of truth is upon us, the initiative has passed over to the officers in the field. <sighs> at first I swallowed it. But then I began to get angry again. I thought to myself, here are 20 generals sitting on their thumbs, all of them too scared to surrender. But they're telling me, a low-ranking captain, to take the initiative, implying that, that if I take the risk and surrender, then I'll have to face the consequences. And if Hitler has you shot later on for showing initiative, that's just tough luck. I was thinking, if you've got full powers to capitulate, then that's what you should do. Only a few officers come to the same conclusion. The majority feel that they must cling to their duty and honor. Honor is a bond. And anyone who betrays his honor is a traitor to the fatherland, who would be condemned to death in absentia. And that includes officers and generals. Yes, it was important to the officers. With Paulus, for example, his glory as a general and his respect in the eyes of the German people would have been destroyed if he had surrendered. But the ordinary soldier said, to hell with their honor. It is the 30th of January, the 10th anniversary of the Nazi regime. In a broadcast speech, Hermann Goering describes defeat in terms of heroism. And in the end, although this may sound harsh, it matters little whether soldiers fall and die in Stalingrad, in the North African desert, or icy Norway. If they achieve greatness by offering themselves as a sacrifice, it is so that their people may live. The soldiers in Stalingrad are listening to their own funeral oration. And that's when I lost my temper completely. And not just for myself. It was for all of us. According to what he said, all of us were dead, as if the last officer had been blown to smithereens with all his men. 
But there were still many thousands of us when he told that infamous lie to all our wives and children. The 2nd of February, and the battle is over, as 100,000 men lay down their arms. Paulus is among them. Just before the end, Hitler promotes him to the rank of field marshal, an unmistakable hint that he should take his own life. But Paulus, who was once a warrior and a leader, is now a spineless weakling. No German field marshal has ever been taken alive by the enemy, until now. His defeated troops are held in the pocket for two and a half months. After the surrender, we had two and a half thousand Germans locked up in the cellars. They were full of lice, filthy, and wrapped in blankets. They looked just like scarecrows, and on their feet they wore jackboots, just like cartoon Germans. The Soviets report that the 6th Army has been defeated, but according to a secret document produced by Russian military intelligence, more than 10,000 Germans are putting up a bitter resistance. They fear captivity and hide in the sewers of the ruined city. On the 13th of February, we were all at a movie show. Well, in the open air, of course. As the company was going back to our quarters, some Germans opened fire on us. They'd been hiding for all that time in the ruins. Of course, they were shot. I'm not too sure about this. But I think two or three of them were wounded, and the rest killed. We also had casualties. A pity, for this was just two weeks after the surrender. 2,418 soldiers and officers were killed. 8,646 were taken prisoner, according to reports. In early March, the last German soldiers lay down their arms. Stalingrad is the Soviet Army's first big success. This victory on the Volga is a milestone, the turning point of the Second World War. We all cried. We shouted hooray and fired in the air. We had a big fireworks display. At all possible opportunities, we blazed away with our revolvers and machine pistols. We all shouted hooray and kissed each other and shed tears of joy. The German prisoners face an uncertain future. For these exhausted men, the march into captivity becomes a torture. I was feeling just like a piece of wood. I could do nothing to motivate myself. I was just swept away. Yes, we marched on over the body parts of soldiers who had been crushed by the tanks. They were scattered over the trenches, frozen solid in the blood-stained snow. The picture is still vivid in my mind's eye. Still there. We marched over snow and ice, past the bodies, scattered right and left. Those who couldn't keep up and had been shot. And in the evening, I was so worn out that I just stayed there, sitting by the side of the road, 
I was hoping that our Red Army escorts would put me out of my misery with a bullet. Two soldiers from my unit came along. They obviously liked me, for they grabbed me, one on the left and one on the right, got me marching again and caught up with the others. They explained to me how they were going to cope with captivity. They wanted to work and that they were determined to do whatever it took under any circumstances to get back home. And I realized I wanted that too. Many men do not survive the march. At least 20,000 die along the way. But the Germans' great fear that they will be executed proves groundless. And there in front of us stands a high-ranking officer smoking a looted cigar, a big, lovely cigar, puffing it so that the smoke rings rise in the air. And then our little fellow from Berlin chirps up and says, Hey, that looks good. How about a puff then? And he sticks his hand out to the officer. But the officer just frowns like that. Then suddenly grins and hands over the lit cigar. And that incident gave me hope that maybe we would actually be treated properly. It wasn't at all as if we'd surrendered to people full of hate who wanted to destroy us. Nonetheless, the death rate is high. There are so many German prisoners that the Red Army is stretched to the limit of its resources. We miscalculated badly. The Soviet command and the planning unit were completely mistaken. We thought that there were about 80,000 German prisoners in Stalingrad, but there were more than three times as many. The first mercy that was shown us was when the army command forced the soldiers to give half of their bread ration to the prisoners. That left them with hardly any supplies. The army's connections with Russia were broken. All the roads and railways had been bombed. They were also having great difficulty in looking after their own people. Hunger tests the soldiers to the limit. In that camp, they were cutting bodies up and selling the meat. Of course, we had no idea it was human flesh, but we ate it nonetheless. Normal morals were destroyed in Stalingrad. I saw Germans turn into cannibals. For me, the basis of life that I learned in my parents' home was the civilized, honorable world. But all that had broken down in Stalingrad. They just couldn't maintain it in the face of such an inhumane conflict. It is now early March 1943, and in the temporary camps near Stalingrad, Roughly 50,000 prisoners have perished. The death toll is unusually high in the wake of the 12 weeks starvation these malnourished men have endured in the besieged Kessel. Even a well-nourished man would have died there. Typhus killed many. And diphtheria, they didn't have to be weak and starving. But those who were weak and starving had no resistance at all. Every day in the morning, they used to go around and see who had died and who was still alive. And then they took the bodies away somehow or another, sometimes in a disrespectful manner. The fellows who did that job used to grab the dead by the feet and drag them behind. The head used to shake from side to side, as if they were saying, not this way. Als hätten sie sagen wollen, 
nur das nicht. Es war so, dass es eine Erlösung war, dass es It was almost a feeling of relief when somebody died and was taken away the next day. Because it left more room. In front of the barracks, there were heaps of bodies which were dragged away by teams of workers. And one day, I couldn't take another night in the barracks. So many of them used to just sit there and soil themselves without any hesitation. It stank like the plague. And there it was vile. I simply couldn't take it any longer. I had to get out. But then, I couldn't get back in. There was an icy wind outside, and snow was falling. I went through the camp to another barracks, but they wouldn't let me in either. Then, right on the edge of the camp, I found yet another hut. It was very still inside, so I went in and settled down. I lay down between bundled figures. I was utterly exhausted. Then I noticed a hand, and a head. This is where they stored the corpses. So there I lay, among the dead. Death rules the prisoner of war camps. I went down with typhus myself, and it was a strange feeling every morning to have your neighbor checking you to see if you were still alive. And one thing I noticed was that dying of typhus is a relatively humane way to go. In the later stages, the sick men began to have fantasies. They wanted to go to the airfield, to the railway station. They wanted to collect their house keys so that they could go home. The Soviet doctors didn't give up. They helped their enemy to the best of their ability. During the epidemic, we had a Jewish doctor, a lady who treated us with great humanity. She came from Leningrad. She lost an arm during the German bombardment. And all her family were killed. And yet, she looked after her German patients 100%. She did everything she could. She personally saved my life by sending me to a field hospital against my will. If she hadn't done that, I would have caught typhus. The medical staff tried really hard. Our chief medical officer used to say, we are dealing with human beings. At this moment, there are no fascists, only sick men. Only 33,000 men survived the prison camp. They are taken away in goods trains to perform forced labor. Traveling in unheated wagons, they are only fed every third day. Nearly half of them die on a journey which crosses the entire Soviet Union. 18,000 prisoners are sent to camps in the Ural Mountains, Siberia, and Kazakhstan, where they were put to work mining coal and uranium. Some of them are tried as war criminals and sentenced to 25 years hard labor. In these remote regions, temperatures of 60 degrees Celsius below zero are common. It 
Kälte, das bedeutet auch, auch Such great cold Gewalt means that the wind chill factor came into play. It was always stormy weather in winter and the temperature sank to 30 or 40 below zero. We were obviously in a deeply depressing situation, which led to a feeling of hopelessness. 25 years means forever, and we really believed that we would have to sit there forever. And that we would never see our homes again. Many of these prisoners will not survive the harsh conditions and hard labor. Only 6,000 of them will eventually be sent home. You must not die here. You must survive. You want to go home. You want to see your wife and children again. Your parents. Your sisters. That's what gave me an unbreakable will to stay alive. Conditions in the camps improve as the Soviet authorities try to hold the inmates' death rate down. In the end, we were fed very well. We began to improve. We got stronger and made good recovery. We also heard there, there was to be a camp library. It was full of books, all right. So we could educate ourselves in the library they gave us. Of course, there were political books too. Marx, Engels, Das Kapital, and all the writings of Stalin and Lenin too. We learned all their theories from the books. At the same time, they're trying to enlist German soldiers in the struggle against Hitler. There is a national committee and a league of anti-Nazi officers who disseminate propaganda against the Third Reich. These men are looked on as traitors by their comrades in arms. The whistle went off. It didn't last very long, but my own comrades turned against me. They even spat on me. In the barracks room, where we slept in four beds with metal frames, they shifted mine out into the middle of the room. I was sent to Coventry in splendid isolation. I was totally boycotted and cut off from human contact. And I must say that to lose the support of your comrades in prison is a severe punishment. Those siding with the Soviets will be resented forever. By May 1945, most of the prisoners are aware that Germany has been defeated. Late one evening, we were all still up, and it was announced that the war was over. And they started telling us, Skora Budi Demoi. That means you're going home soon. Skora Budi Demoi. And we asked when this would be. We were told, when Russia has been rebuilt, then you can go home. It could take another 10 years. Stalingrad is rebuilt by Germans. The city, now renamed Volgograd, has a modern population of one million. This city is forever linked with the horrors of war. Today, the scars inflicted by war have not faded. Buildings are still pockmarked with bullet holes. For the Germans, the city on the Volga River remains a symbol of unspeakable sadness. Only a few of them came home from Stalingrad.
am 18. September on the 18th of September, steht bei we uns were at im home Haus when someone came to the house and knocked. So I went downstairs and said, how can I help you? Who are you looking for? Yes, he said, I'm looking for somebody. Well, our name is Tomish, I said. Yes, Tomish, that's us. Then he said, I just wanted to let you know that your husband is alive. I couldn't take it in. I don't know what I asked him. I don't know what we said to each other. I never even asked his name or where he lived, who he was. I said, thank you so much. It can't be true. My husband is alive. I held my daughter in my arms and went racing round to tell the family, can you believe it? Can you believe it? Helmut is alive. It was indescribable. The prisoners' families place their hopes on Konrad Adenauer, the first German state chancellor. He goes to Moscow and appeals for the release of the captive soldiers, successfully. But even as the troop trains roll back to the fatherland, old scores are settled with so-called traitors. And in Frankfurt, in Frankfurt there were quite a few murders. Bodies lying in the street the next morning. Old comrades take their delayed revenge on those prisoners who had sided with the Russians. By 1955, the last prisoners of war are back from the Soviet Union, including those who survived the inferno of the Stalingrad pocket. Many families are hoping for news of their missing men, fathers, and sons. I felt so powerless. I sympathized, but what was I supposed to do when people kept asking me, do you know this man? Do you know this man? And if you're a sensitive type, that sort of thing can really get to you. And then I saw while my mother was crying. Other women could put their arms around their husbands, and the men could pick up their children and hold them. There was such joy and embraces, but we had to go away feeling empty. Stalingrad was a death sentence, for me as well as for him. I was dead too. I was dead. I was dead and I had to go on living for the sake of the child. Our child needed me. And then I came to the house. And I was overjoyed to be home. And all the people came out and greeted me and embraced me. And there were flowers everywhere. And the bells were ringing. And then I... The main thing was that I had spent six years in captivity, which turns you into another man entirely. And that's why I was afraid when I came home. Of course, there was that to begin with. But then, on the other hand, there was the longing and so much joy. That was the most important thing, of course. And the gratitude always stayed with us in our marriage, in our long-lasting marriage. We were thankful that my husband came home. More than a quarter million men did not return. 
their bones still lie at Stalingrad, mingled with the remains of half a million Red Army soldiers. Today, many remain unburied on the greatest battlefield of the Second World War. That was the worst. I couldn't bury him. I could not stand beside his grave. To this day, I cannot live with that. Sometimes, I don't even know whether he's dead or alive. 